what would happen if the church were to uh, get it, were to take the Holy Father seriously with this idea of rigidity? Let's, let's just magically say we were to get past it. What would a church look like? I think that the church would be better equipped to, to respond to the um, challenges of our times. I said in the previous episode that um, rigidity is a sin of the faithful Catholics or a temptation that affects disproportionately the faithful Catholics. And it's true that nowadays we live in a very secularized, very morally lax society. And, of course, the church wants to bring the gospel also to that, but the people here do not understand. It's like we're speaking a different language. So who is going to evangelize? And Pope Francis talks about evangelization a lot. If they talk, he talks about evangelization a lot, so evangelization is important. But how are people going to evangelize? It's through the faithful Catholics, those who, uh, in spite of all society telling them that they are wrong, they still stick with the church. But precisely because of that, those faithful Catholics need to be better equipped to, for this challenge. And that's the reason why Pope Francis criticizes faithful Catholics because those are the ones who need to pass the test of fire mm -hmm. so that they can go into the mission and mm -hmm. bring all these lost sheep into the fold. If these faithful Catholics falter, then who's there? If the salt of the earth does not give flavor, what does... Why, what does what is its purpose? So it, it is, I think it's actually a sign of the times that we have a Pope that is criticizing the faithful Catholics because it just shows that we, this, these faithful Catholics need to pass this test mm -hmm. if we are to go to the, to the world and evangelize. Yeah. If we have this message, we have to be good messengers. And, that's why Pope Francis also speaks against proselytism. Mm -hmm. It's not about not wanting to bring the gospel to, to, to others. It's, uh, proselytism is something that is self-referential. I am the faithful Catholic. Let me teach you how to, what, to, what you need to do. That's but evangelization, yeah, evangelization is not that. Evangelization is... Um, I, I'm, I'm nobody. Okay, I am, I am just a person who, through the grace of God, has received this vision that is not shared by any other people. So I'm going to try to live my life in coherence with this message, even though I am frail, even though I'm vulnerable. I will live according, in of course, this message because this message saved me as I was frail as I was weak, it saved me, it helped me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is what's going to click on other people who have their hearts completely closed to the message of this church so that they will say, oh, so this message helped you, so tell me more about it. And this is evangelization. So it starts with us. So of course, those all these people love proselytism. Because proselytism does not cost them anything. I am the teacher. You are the one who needs to change. I don't need to change at all. Evangelization puts the burden on me. And the others follow organically, naturally. You don't put the burden on others. You put the burden on yourself. And if you put the burden on yourself, you are rigid with yourself but, of course, not excessively. Otherwise, you will fall into scruples, which is also not good, and I explain that in the book. But you put your rigid, more rigid to you, towards yourself than with others. I, I, I know that it was a father of the church. I don't remember um, who he was. I don't know if it's St. John Chrysostom, but he said that the, 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 if you are a saint, 
you are rigid with yourself, not with others. Where you're, you're patient with others and rigid with yourself. Whereas the one who is not a saint is rigid with others and relaxed with himself. So that's the, that's the point. If the faithful Catholics cannot uh, go beyond this temptation, the evangelization effort will be doomed, which will never be. But uh, it will be doomed. And I, I, one thing that it's not in the book, and I've never talked about this, but I always always found fascinating that that passage of the Bible in which Gideon is amassing an army, uh, and it's a very small army of Israelites to go against the the other the invaders, uh, and um, Gideon has this small army, and then he. He, he starts making all these small tests and people keep failing. Go to the water and drink. And some people drink like with the hand and others drink. And they said, well, those who drank this way have to go away. And he, he, and he keeps making these small tests and the army get, keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. But that's precisely this, because this army, this small army who is fulfilling the the, the these rules uh, and who is uh, passing these challenges are the ones who are going to show the glory of God so that the glory is not on the army is it itself and the rigorists are always talking about the remnant the remnant uh, uh, there is going to be a remnant the church is going to be smaller jo Joseph Ratzinger said the church is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller yeah but what they don't know is and that's something that I wrote in where Peter is an article uh, uh, is that the remnant mm -hmm. never, never gloried himself in being a remnant. The remnant actually was the one who interceded to God for mercy on the sinners throughout history in the Bi from the Bible until the saints of the 20th century, the, the, the shepherds of Adam and all. The remnant, the small, the, the the smallest, are not the ones who say we are special and we are going to create this wall to protect our purity. No, they are the ones who say, "Oh Lord, please, there's so many people, so many sinners. Please save them. Please help them. Have mercy on them." Those are the remnant. Wow. That that's historically how it has always been. That, that there's oh you're gonna you'll be able to tell it so much better than I can but there's a chapter right as you're talking about either it was before or after Constantine I can't remember but this exact thing played out and I'd never heard this story before and it was so beautiful how there was a persecution on Christians and for like two years I think and they were locked up and they were tortured or persecuted or ignored and then there were a bunch of others who decided they didn't want to suffer the same fate and so they paid the tributes they you know, through the grains of salt or, into, or whatever it was into the, uh, the, the idols. Sense. There yes. you go. And then when that emperor died and everything was relaxed, everybody who was actually imprisoned interceded on behalf of all of the, the perfecti and all of the everybody who's, who wanted to be returned to communion with the church. And the church was now stuck in this paroxysm of like, perfection and like, oh, we, we can't let them contaminate us. And all of the people who had endured so much of the suffering were the ones interceding on their behalf. Um, yes, it's something that I also found fascinating. And it's interesting when you study the, the I did not seek these details. It just came out to me when I studied the history. And that's the novation crisis in which the Roman emperors were persecuting the Christians. We know all that story. And there was a time when the, the persecution was so severe that almost the church apostatized because it was horrible. People were killed. People were tortured. People were exiled. They, were they lost all their property. Uh, men were enslaved, sent to the mines. You know, rich people, rich people were sent to the mines. Women were sent to brothels, forced to, for, to, for prostitution. And the, they lost everything. And it was so severe. And to prevent all of this, to save your life, to save your family, you, you only had to throw a pinch of incense into the, the pagan So, of course, 
the vast majority of the church apostatized. And then when the persecution subsided, these people wanted to come back to the church. And the, the priests and the bishops were like, no, this, this is laxism. This. And we must understand that at this time, grave sins did not have a proper means to being forgiven after baptism. They you make did. the point later on that confession, yeah. in the introduction yes. of confession the of the sacrament, of was seen as such a laxist yeah. thing. Yeah, the sacrament of reconciliation developed from that, yeah. and so the priests were saying, "No, sorry, now you can, now you can never take communion again. May God have mercy on your soul at the end, but now you excommunicated yourself because there was no mechanism to return these people back." Yeah, and. We have to give honor to those who actually endured, who survived this, this horrible torment. And the, those who, who remained faithful, the Stantes, uh, they were the ones who said, we don't want honor, we don't want, want to be honored at the expense of all those poor souls that are outside of the church, forgive them. We forgive them. Why don't you forgive us? Some of them even said, oh, some of the, because remember that the theology was still not well developed at the time. So uh, the martyrs become saints who intercede for us. Uh, I'm almost a martyr, so I am going to uh, have uh, anticipated intercessory powers. <laughs> and I'm going to intercede for them. And some people had like signed a, a do formal document to the Roman emperor saying, "Oh, we worship idols," uh, and they and those who remain faithful then said, "No, now you're going to sign this paper saying that you're not a worshiping idols." So everything is balanced out. So and the th this show of mercy forced the church hierarchy, in a sense, to recognize. Yeah. That they could not, that this was unsustainable. They could mm -hmm. not have 90% of the church outside of communion. And it's something absolutely beautiful. And these who had endured torture, who lost family members, who there were, there were a, 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 a person who, I, who interviewed me recently told me that. Some of them were in those synods, those councils where they made decisions. One of them did not have an eye. Another did not have a leg. And they were like saying, no, no, no. We, we have to forgive these poor souls because they were the ones who knew how hard it had been. So they, yeah. they did not hold any hostility towards those who had failed because they knew how hard it had been. And and that, that's that's precisely a difference of attitude. There are people who say, oh, I follow this, so you also have to follow it. It's only fair. But a, a, a Catholic who, who felt the true thorn of the flesh of those, of, of the hardness, of the hardships, this is the person who knows that, no. that I received mercy so I need to extend mercy to others. Yeah. It's so it's a different attitude between those who endure hardship. Either you use that to accuse others, and then you fall into the sin of pride, or you use that to become more humble, to learn to love your brothers, and precisely try to understand the weakness of the human of humans. Uh, and try to help them. Yeah, there's that that um, whole point of the book. Obviously, it's called rigidity. So that that compulsion, the temptation on the part of those who see themselves as faithful, uh, the temptation. You said this in the last episode, which I thought was brilliant. Um, which is the the temptation of the faithful is to become rigid. And I was thinking about the uh that latest i don't know i think hulu put it out maybe it was a year ago called amen where the holy father sat with a group of young people uh and then the one girl i remember who was who was a, a faithful catholic and uh making a couple of points and then the holy father very very gently leaned into her and he 
he quite basically warned her about the temptation of rigidity. And I remember seeing Twitter blow up about how could he attack the only faithful person on his side when she's doing, you know, working so hard to, you know, uh, stand up for what's true. And it's like, well, at the same time, I had to sit with it for a minute and then realize, oh, what he saw is that there's that temptation of being so self-assured. And of course, it's a, it's a hard job, especially today, to try to understand what is the right thing to do and then to have to hold fast to it in an environment where everybody thinks you're ridiculous. Um, this actually brings up a, a thought about how, just again, reading this book and how it feels like a spiritual retreat. Because every era, every chapter that, that you chronicle as we go through the story of the church shows how easy it would have been for the church to collapse into a rigid mindset. Here are the rules. Here is what is just obviously how we should be responding to the situation. This is what just makes sense. And then the church doesn't side with that. And I, I, thinking of oneself as like a new atheist, you know, looking at the story of the church and you just imagine it's this massive monolithic magisterial thing progressing and just torturing and crushing people over the centuries. And then you go and you read a book like yours and you're like, the church had every opportunity to be that monolithic magisterial thing. And it never did in that, in that way. It's this thin red line of, of constant trying to find the, the merciful thing, the, the thing that respects the person without falling to either side of being too lax um, or being too rigid. Um, last little question then for you. What are some, uh, some of your favorite people that you like to think about? Like you'd mentioned... Um, St. Paul, you know, or St. Jane Chantal, who are some, some short little stories of, of saints or people that you like to think about that inspire you? Well, uh, <clears throat> that's something that um, it's also interesting. Uh, it comes a little in the vein of the God of Surprises, which is um, some the, the saints that come and I feel like help me in, in these projects are never the ones that uh, I thought that would come, <laughs> you know, it, 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 because they are the ones who I never thought of. Uh, but they come, they, they actually come and kind of nudge me in the, in the correct direction. I was, I was thinking of, for example, I never particularly cared much about St. Augustine because I always was more fond of St. Thomas Aquinas, for instance. And I was writing, and this book has lots, St. Augustine features in three of the chapters, actually. And one day I was writing on, on St. Augustine and uh, writing this chapter. And I found I had a breakthrough from some writings of St. Augustine and uh, I, oh, this is very good. Let me, let me pick it up. Let me pick it up. And this was completely, completely involuntary. At the end of the day, I was browsing social media and I saw people saying, happy feast day of St. Augustine. <laughs> so this was not, this, I did not search for it. It just happened. So yeah, uh, St. Augustine, sure. He, he is very, actually, it's interesting because we can say that those who were a good antidote for rigidity were, were the ones who actually had to be a bit rigid mm -hmm. or who struggled with rigidity. Okay. And I can think of precisely, for me, the ones that, really helped mold this book were St. Paul, who started out as a Pharisee and fell off the horse, became blind, had to humble himself to recover his vision. And after that, he was the main theologian that understood the proper, uh, the proper functioning of uh, law and grace. On the beginning, it was just the law, and afterwards, he saw grace. The great, the, the grace mm -hmm. is what helps us fulfill the law. So he was a person who had to go against his own rigorism, and 
he learned on it. And the others were St. Augustine and St. Alphonsus Liguori. Both of them, uh, also uh, for St. Augustine started as very lax, very, yeah. very lax. Yeah. And after that, he had to learn to be more rigid. And some of the things that he writes, even on sexuality, even on, uh, to, on our present day, many people say, oh, this is very rigid. And maybe for present day, maybe it's hard for us to conceive of it. Okay. But on the other hand, he also had to moderate his own rigidity because he had to come, he had to fight against Pelagianism. He had to fight against uh, Donatism, and uh, afterwards, uh, after that, he probably had to contend with those who tried to abuse his Augustinian principles, like the Calvinists and the Jansenists. So, uh, so that we would find the balance. So he he also had to find this balance between rigidity and flexibility. In St. Alfonso's Liguori himself as well, he, people think that he was very rigid, and probably by our standards he was, but he found out that he was subscribing to a rigorous mindset, and as soon as he, and Pope Francis talks about it, when he went into the confessionals, and he found the real people in real life, he noticed that he had to tone down a bit. And then he wrote a treaty on moral theology in which he talks, for example, about scruples, you know, that people need to, and he explained how to go against rigidity. And this precisely because of this moral theor theology treatise, the church went from, uh, discovered that rigorism, which is actually a, a proper name of a movement in moral theology, was not the, the, the more accurate one. And so they found the middle one between rigorism and laxism, which was probabilism. And St. Alphonsus Liguori was instrumental in helping the church go through that middle way. So the... These were, I think, the three great saints and St. Francis de Sales, who was a spiritual director of St. Jane of Chantal and helped her fight against scrupulosity. These, I think, are the saints that better encapsulate the, 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 what this book is all about. And they were the ones who, I think, hopefully helped me write it because I, when I was writing about them, I felt that things were easier to write and it was easier for me to find the, the, the ideas that really fit together. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, in wrapping up this one, um, Pedro, where can people find the book online? You can always check the link in the description, but if you're just listening, uh, where can people find you online and find the book? Well, um, the book in English can be found in amazon.com and in Portuguese, uh, you can find it uh, in uh, Amazon.es, the Spanish uh, version of Amazon, which ships to Portugal. And for the people from Brazil, Amazon.com.br. Um, and uh, you can find Rigidity, Faithfulness, or Heterodoxy there. Or in Portuguese, Rigidez, Fidelidade ou Heterodoxia. And uh, you can order it and hopefully enjoy it. <laughs>